Evening everybody, this is Danny Dunkwin237 and this is a uh, response to Check 83F's video uh, about his uh, top 10 slasher movies. Uh, that sounded like a fun subject so I decided to uh, uh, do my own in response to his. Um, there's a lot of other ones I know he uh, as he acknowledged in his video and I, I noticed there's a lot of others but his is um, uh, the first one I watched, actually the only one I watched so far, but um, uh, I have a free moment here to uh, shoot a video because everybody else in the house is asleep, so I figured I would do it. So, um, these are uh, actually in alphabetical order uh, because what difference does it make? Um, so I'll go ahead and get started here. Um, now these, I would say, are the... Um, these are the top ten slasher movies um, that I own. Um, there may be uh, a few out there that I think are better than some of these that I have seen, but uh, I don't own. So um, I'll mention them maybe at the end, but for now these are just going to be ones that I actually own. So we'll get started and um, start with a, a very obvious one. <laughs> Um, Friday the 13th, Part 3 in 3D. This is the DVD. I have not bought the Blu-ray of this yet. This is my favorite Friday the 13th movie. Um, mostly because I think uh, largely due to the fact that they were spending a little bit extra money on the 3D process. And Steve Miner, the director, had polished his uh, directorial skills since Part 2. Um, I think that this is the most stylishly shot of, um, at least of the early Friday the 13th. This, this one has the most, um, um, filmmaking quality to it, I think. It's, it's a well shot, well edited, well paced movie, and, um, it just works as a good thriller. Um, even more so than, like, a horror movie. This one is actually almost more of a thriller, and I like that, um... And uh, the 3D is a lot of fun. I mean, it never passes up an opportunity to throw something in your face, whether it's a yo-yo or a rattlesnake or an eyeball. Um, it's, um, I just think this is the most um, satisfying and entertaining um, entry in the series. Um, I'm actually not a big fan of parts one or two. I think they're both kind of dull and boring. Um, you know, enlivened by just, you know, a little splatter here and there. But this one, I think, uh, um, a little less gore in it than the rest of the, uh, the most of the series. But what little there is is pretty creative. Um, so, you know, overall, that's why I, I like this one. Um, the next one is the direct sequel to Part 3, Friday the 13th, the final chapter. Uh, this one is more of a horror movie, I think. This one is darker than Part 3. It's grittier and more mean-spirited than Part 3. But uh, the reason I like this one is because, again, it's, it's fairly well-made. But I think what this one gives, what gives this one a leg up as opposed to um, a leg up over the uh, most of the series is that they got really good actors to be in this one. Uh, they actually got some fairly reputable and recognizable 80s, um, uh, you know, teen actors who, you know, didn't quite make the Brat Pack, like um, Crispin Glover and Lawrence Monison and Judy Aronson and um, Corey Feldman, of course. Um, so this one, I think, has a really good cast. Characters are a little bit more dimension to them than usual, and it's um, fairly suspenseful. There's some... Uh, um, pretty brutal gore in it, and Jason gets, uh, <laughs> Jason gets, uh, the, uh, Jason's death in this one packs quite a wallop. It's one of the more disgusting moments I've seen in a, in a rated R Hollywood movie, so. So that's number two. Those are the only two Friday the 13th on the list. I think, uh, some of the other ones are, are entertaining, but those two I think are by far the best in the series. Um, follow this up with Toby Hooper's classic, the Fun House. 
Um, I love this movie. I think that this is a, a very underrated movie. Um, uh, barely, I would say, it barely qualifies as a slasher movie because so few people get uh, slashed in it. But I, I, you know, it, it follows the basic formula. But I think it's it's just as much a monster movie as it is a slasher movie. Um, but this one is very, very. It's um, it's got an incredible style to it. It's really surreal, really expressionistic. Um, very creepy, very seedy atmosphere. Um, they really um, use the um, location of the uh, traveling carnival to the fullest extent. You know, there's just this movie just drips of just just, just oozes sleaze and weirdness and um, and uh, creepiness uh, all the way through. And um, and there's um, uh, just these these great incredible moment these, these incredible moments. It's it's a very very vividly um, atmospheric movie. Um, it's deliberately paced. doesn't doesn't fly by uh, very quickly. It's uh, it takes its time, but um, no, it's very eerie. It's very uh, twisted, and uh, I like it a lot. And the 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 monster or killer or whatever you want to call him in this is one of the more bizarre looking um masked killers that I've seen in a in a slasher movie, a horror movie of any kind. It looks more like something you would see in like a David Cronenberg sci fi horror body horror movie than uh than a standard slasher movie, which is what makes this not a standard slasher movie. So that's number three. Number four is Halloween. Um, Halloween, the first Halloween is by far my favorite of the series. My second favorite of the, um, of the series would be Halloween 3, which is sort of a, you know, obviously a non-sequel, really has nothing to do with the rest of the movies, but and Halloween 2, no, Halloween 2 is okay. Um, I really didn't like any of the other ones, um, particularly. Halloween H2O was okay, but, um, I've... I heard a lot of people say a lot of good things about Halloween 4. I've heard a lot of people recently talk about how good Halloween 4 is, so I might have to give that one another try. Uh, but I remember seeing it in the theater and not thinking much of it. But this one is um, very suspenseful. This one reminds me of like almost like a... like a. Speaking of just the funhouse, it's almost like a carnival funhouse from hell. You know, Michael Myers comes home. It's like he just plays this Halloween prank, you know, and he, he kills his sister goes catatonic for 15 years then targets one girl to um to scare the crap out of Halloween night 15 years later and she he just puts her through a night of hell and um I think that's what's so scary about this one is that he has um no motivation for what he does he just seems to randomly pick um Lori Jamie Lee Curtis's character uh maybe because she dropped the key off of the house who knows but um, just on the subject of this, one of the one of the scariest moments of this movie is one that people don't usually mention, and it's a scene toward the end. Little mild spoiler here: when um, he is attacking Jamie Lee Curtis after she thinks he's dead, and he's attacking her, and she manages to pull off the mask for just just a second, and for li literally like two seconds, you see his face, and the look on Michael Myers' actual face is just as pale and blank and emotionless as the mask itself. And I find that moment to be absolutely chilling because it's just, he's, it's like he has no conscience or, or, or he, he's not even thinking about what he's doing. He's like a robot, you know? Um, and I find that very, very disturbing. Um, so this, I think that what makes this movie so scary is that, you know, a lot of times a character, a killer or whatever, having no motivation um, is a weakness in a movie, you know what I mean? It's like, it's, it's almost lazy, laziness in the writing. This one, it's very effective. He's like a force of nature, Michael Myers. He's like, almost like he's programmed to do this. And to me, there's something very unsettling about that. So... So we go from a movie where a character has no motivation at all to a movie where uh, 
that introduced us to a killer with um, much more depth and character than most screen slashers. Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer. Um, this is sort of an antidote, in a way, to Friday the 13th. Um, Halloween, all those, you know, those um, uh, slashers where it's basically just, the whole point is just to have some, you know, masked, faceless killer with no, with the most rudimentary backstory going on, killing a bunch of kids for, you know, just in creative ways with next to no point to it other than the sensationalism of it. And they decided to, well, what if we gave the killer a mind? And what if we, what if we gave him a mind, gave him some um, backstory, some motivation, some character? What if he was the star of the movie? And uh, Michael Rooker, um, you know, plays this character who is a, uh, you know, basically a professional serial killer for, for all intents and purposes. What he does, his vocation is killing people. And he um, sympathizes with him. He, uh, he's, had a, he's had a horrible life. You can understand, you can't understand, but you, you know, there's, there's, there's reason why he ended up the way he did. And um, what I find really un really upsetting about this movie is the fact that throughout all of this, Henry manages to retain some level of his humanity. His friend, who he talks into joining him on a few um, kills, Otis, played by Tom Tolles, um, does not. So whereas Henry, Henry, Henry um, knows where to draw the line, Otis goes to the it hits a point where he's just beyond, um, uh, beyond any kind of morality or uh, conscience. He just becomes the most perverse and twisted um, killer, even more so than Henry. And I find that to be you know Henry Henry's bad. Henry is a <laughs> he's killed who knows how many people he's killed. And yet Otis takes it even further than Henry is willing to go. And um, so this is a movie about some very broken, desperate people um, living in a, a very um, unfortunate and uh, unpleasant uh, situation. Um, far more depth and, um, and um, seriousness to this one than most slasher movies. And this, this is definitely a slasher movie. It's just that there's, you know, the uh, slasher is given actual characterization rather than just putting on a mask and going out and hacking people. Um, that leads us to a very similar movie. It came out before Henry. Maniac. Um... This one is, is very similar to Henry in that the uh, the killer is the star of the movie, and the killer is also um, uh, given uh, you sympathize to some extent with the killer. Um, but in this one, um, Henry has no real um, What's the word? Um, there's no real inner conflict with Henry. He just does what he does. And he has no regret about what he, what he does. It's just who he is and, and what he does. Frank Zito, in this, played by um, the fantastic Joe Spinell, does have um, a conflict. He does not want to kill anybody. He can't help himself. And he has nightmares about it. He tries to almost talk himself out of it some, uh, while he's doing it. At one point, he kills a prostitute and immediately after has to run into the bathroom and throw up. Uh, and then he cries over her body. Um, this movie, when it first came out, was seen as nothing more than a, you know, a, the, the worst kind of sleazy exploitation movie that was misogynistic and and um, just uh, just just utter and complete garbage. But um, I think it's a much better movie than that. Um, I think it's a much more um, profound movie than that. Um, again, it has a lot to do with the fact that there are, are three-dimensional characters. Um, and um, the acting is excellent. The filmmaking is very good. And uh, it is sleazy. And it is 
disgusting and it is horrifying, um, I would not say it's misogynistic. Um, because to me, a movie to be misogynistic, uh, a, a movie uh, for a movie to be misogynistic would have to somehow glorify what he does um, to the women in this movie, or, or or at least it would have to play the scenes like for thrills, and it doesn't. The scenes in this movie when he kills women are are pretty horrifying and disturbing. Plus the fact that he also kills men. Um, you know, in fact, probably the most violent, shocking death in the movie is a scene where he blows a guy's head off with a shotgun. Um, so it's kind of, to me, it's kind of knee-jerk and wrong-headed reaction to the movie to say that it's misogynistic. Um, he is a character who, he's a, miso he's a misogynist, and he's been made a misogynist by abuse, specifically by his mother, um, which sort of has a psycho um, uh, parallel there. And um, it, it just, you know, over the, it's, it's snowballed over the years into turning him into this psychotic killer who stalks and kills women um, and then can't forgive himself for doing it. And then there's the you know, infamous finale, uh, which I won't give away here for those of you who haven't seen it, but... Uh, this is definitely one to see. It's a, it's a much better movie than its reputation would suggest. Just recently was remade with Elijah Wood, which I'm trying to wrap my head around. <clears throat> Next we go to another serial killer movie that takes place in Manhattan. The New York Ripper. Um, this is an unusual movie for Lucio Fulci. Uh, mostly Lucio Fulci's movies were... Um, very, very gory. They tended to be very um, surreal and dreamlike, and most of all, they were they were basically just for you know, they were they were meant as just entertainment. They were meant as just sort of like a freak show, you know, a gross out type movie. This one is much more. Um, this this is a much more mean spirited thriller than uh, he usually did. Uh, the kind of thing he usually did. Um, this one's a lot uh, grittier and um, um, spare than most of his movies. Most of his movies have a lot of really, um, you know, just weird, surreal, uh, nightmarish sequences in them um, so that you know what you're watching is a fantasy. Um, you know, the City of the Living Dead and the Beyond and Zombie, you know, they all have this kind of dreamy quality to them. Uh, this one is very, very gritty. It's very... Um, uh, it's very realistic, and there is a absolutely uh, um, excruciating and horrifying razor blade murder uh, that goes on and on and on. It's uh, it's as pretty uh, pretty nasty. But um, this one, I think, as much as I like this movie, um, it borders on. Uh, misogyny, because it definitely, um, I, I, I'm not going to say it eroticizes violence against women, but um, the violence against women in this movie is, is taken to such an extreme that it almost becomes um, like some kind of performance art or something, you know what I mean? So it's, um, it's, uh, it sort of revels in the brutality committed against the women in the movie. Um, so, if you're going to watch this, just keep that in mind. It's, it says at the top of here, the most controversial movie ever made, horror film ever made. I, I don't know that I agree with that, but it's it's pretty intense. So, <clears throat> But I like it a lot. Let me have uh, the oldest movie of all the ones that I've been looking at. And again, this, this actually falls in line with Maniac and um, Henry. <clears throat> Peeping Tom. Uh, some people might say this isn't a slasher movie. I think it is. Um, um, but this is about a guy who works as a um, camera assistant. And he, uh, uh, again, through <laughs> systematic abuse growing up, he's turned into this uh, homicidal maniac. And he uh, kills women and um, films 
uh, the murders as he's doing it, specifically to, to film their face, the look of fear on their face, um, fascinates him. He's making a documentary about fear, and uh, he does this by filming himself killing women, getting their, their face. Um, and uh, so it's, uh, again, it's a very artistic movie. It's uh, kind of amazing that it's made by the same guy that made The Red Shoes and, uh, and uh, the Colonel Blimp movie. Um, but it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's a really incredible movie. It's definitely worth checking out. Um, and a lot of people say that uh, it's the movie that inspired Hitchcock to make Psycho. So Next we've got another 80s slasher movie. The Prowler. This is one of the better... I, I would say, figure out a way to say that. This is one of the better by-the-numbers slasher movies that there that uh, is out there. This is, there's, there's really nothing to set this apart from your standard slasher movie other than the fact that it's much better made. It's got some good atmosphere. Um, and... Uh, you know, even even in the character department, the characters are all very one-dimensional. You really don't care about any of them. It's just it's a very well-made, uh, tightly constructed movie, um, and uh, and it moves along at a good pace. And there's some really um, uh, brutal uh, murders in it, and some really even uh, a couple of murders that are that are, that, are, that border on uh, surreal. There's a scene where a guy gets a bayonet through his head. And it doesn't kill him at first, which is pretty excruciating to watch. He's still struggling with the killer while he's got a bayonet, you know, that's gone into the top of his head out through his chin. And uh, it's just, it's like, wow. It's one of the more, um, you know, horrifically violent things I've seen in a slasher movie. But um, I like this one. It's, uh, it's just a good, solid um, horror movie. And then we're going to uh, finish up with what I think is the best slasher movie ever made. just happens that it's the last one alphabetically. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Um, there's, of course, some debate as to what started the whole slasher genre. I think that basically, to my knowledge, this is the first one that followed all the... Um, and I could be wrong. Not this is not etched in stone. This is the first one that I know of, anyway, that followed all the um, uh, staples. You know, people going to some sort of remote location and getting picked off one by one by um, by a, a, a mad killer. <clears throat> um, this one, you know, of course, had you know the classic idea of having the killer have a mask. Um, of having the, um, you know, the prophetic character sort of warning the people, you know, the, the, the old man at the beginning saying, you know, like, ah, oh, things happen here and no one wants to listen to an old man, you know. And then they, uh, they even throw in the <clears throat> twist of having the killer have family members helping him to commit these crimes. This is all very o oversimplification of the plot, but, you know, this has um, a lot of the, uh, the staples uh, that would go into the standard slasher uh, plot line for most of the slasher movies that followed. Um, this is by far the best in the series. Um, I did like the remake. I thought the remake was a, was pretty good. And I, I, even though I think it's really a terrible movie, I like Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. Um, I don't think it's a good movie at all. I think it's really pretty bad. But I still like it. Just because it's so bizarre. And, uh, and, and, and and weird and <laughs> and uh, um, and insane. So, <laughs> <clears throat> so that's that. That's that's my top ten slasher movies. A couple of honorable mentions. <clears throat> um, I didn't include Psycho because I don't consider that to be an actual slasher movie. I think that's much more of a, of a mystery. Um, couple other ones that I, uh, um, oh, see, I should have written this down. I, uh, 
there was one I is one I don't own that I uh, uh a good one that I didn't uh, that I don't own is a sleepaway camp. Now sleepaway camp is not a particularly good or um, interesting slasher movie. There's not much that sets it apart. It's very standard uh, goings on, except when you get to the very end of the movie. Which, uh, for those of you who have seen it, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And those of you who have not seen it, it's just for such a banal and um, completely by the numbers uh, movie with no surprises at all. The ending is so twisted and perverse and freakishly weird uh, that it just hits you like a ton of bricks, comes out of left field, and you just like, what the hell just happened, you know? So um, I would recommend it just for that, just for the last couple of minutes. Uh, and, um, <clears throat> yeah, and another one of my favorite uh, slash movies, I didn't include it just because it's so bad, <laughs> but um, I, I enjoy it as a movie. It's a lot of fun, is uh, Pieces. Um, I, I'd say it's like the Plan 9 from Outer Space of slasher movies. It's incredibly sleazy. It's incredibly gory. It's, uh, it's, it's just so, it's just, it's so scummy and scuzzy and icky and nasty. And yet, it's, um, also incredibly stupid. And, um, got some of the most hilariously awful dialogue of all time. There's a very, um... Uh, there's a theory that uh, the movie is actually a comedy, that it's supposed to be funny, and that may be true. But um, it's, it's a hoot. It's hilarious. If you can get by the, uh, the really uh, uh, incredibly gruesome special effects and the, uh, the uh, sleazy atmosphere, it's another movie that I would say is definitely misogynistic. It definitely uh, eroticizes violence against women. Um, but it does so in such a over-the-top, ridiculous way that it's hard to be offended by it. Um, <clears throat> but uh, it's a lot of fun pieces. I, I'd recommend that. And uh, another one I like is uh, The Toolbox Murders, which, again, I think is, you know, it's a woman, you know, it's a movie that, you know, when I hear women's groups talk about slash movies, I can kind of understand where they're coming from with a movie like that. Because, again, I, I think it's a movie that kind of, you know, um, you know, plays violence against women for thrills. And um, the last honorable mention I will give, it's, uh, it's this close to being a, th a slasher th film, but I, I don't think it really is, is uh, The Driller Killer by Abel Ferrara. Uh, it's a very good movie, but it's more, um, it's more like a kind of an artsy um, rip-off of Taxi Driver <laughs> <laughs> more than it is a uh, a slasher movie. It's just instead of using a gun to kill street denizens he hates, he uses a drill. So, um, but yeah, that's uh, that's my list of uh, my top ten slasher movies. I uh, hope you enjoyed this um, uh, special uh, mention to uh, Check eighty three F. If you're watching this, uh, thanks for giving me the idea and. Uh, Hope everybody has a good night. Okay. Now I gotta find my uh, remote. I do this every time. I should hold it in my hand. There we go. Okay. I'm gonna slash this video now. Bye.